We are really delighted and grateful to have this, plenary, this roundtable session moderated by Oliver Martin from The Economist. Thank you, Oliver, so much for coming and joining us. Um, uh, the theme of the uh, roundtable is going to be on competing demands for the land system. And Oliver is the briefings editor of The Economist, and he was previously the energy and environment editor of The Economist, as well as the chief news and features editor for Nature. He specializes in the energy business, climate science and policy, and other green issues. And if you're looking for a reading list for the summer, he's also the author <laughs> of two really interesting books, uh, one of which I'm hoping to read in a few months. <laughs> um, Eating the Sun, How Plants Power the Planet, a study of photosynthesis, its meanings, and its implications. And then moving to another planet, he's written a book called Mapping Mars, Science, Imagination, and the Birth of a World. Welcome, Oliver, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, and good morning to you all, um, both here and in the aula. Um, because you are split between two different spaces, um, I've been asked to not privilege the actually present people um, by uh, asking for questions from the, from the audience, other than through the excellent Slido app, which I may or may not be able to operate, but <laughs> which I will certainly have, have, have a try at. It's been, um, it's a great privilege and pleasure to have been um, invited here, and I found the uh, yesterday absolutely fascinating, because like many um, Johnny-come-latelys um, to the environment, I was kind of introduced to global issues through the atmosphere, um, which is a very wishy-washy and theoretical thing, even though there's some of it in my lungs at the moment. And listening to people talk about the world seen through the prism of land is so excitingly um, complete and concrete um, that, you know, all the land that there is is out there to be pointed at and used and not used and owned. It's all... Um, you can have, it can be catalogued and mapped and it's complete, and that's great. Um, but as I've also been realizing, and as we're planning to address in, in this session, in, in this discussion, um, that doesn't mean that there's one truth to every square meter of the earth. That doesn't mean that, and it also means that, you know, the land is multifaceted and it's opaque, sometimes looking at it in one way, hides the way you would look at it in another way. And so what, the reason I think the organizers have asked me to um, bring the uh, plenary speakers up here today is to try and um, tease out some of the tensions and contradictions um, between their accounts. And I just wanted to start off by just asking a, the, a, a few quick questions so we can just see some differences. How many of you in your um, plenary, pre uh, plenary um, presentation Use the word diet. Yeah, probably. I'm not sure not you sure. did actually. So I think that may be <laughs> probably may be one. Yeah. Who used the word livelihood? Again, just one. Who used the word climate? Okay. Um, who used the word activism? <laughs> okay. Who used the word infrastructure? Okay, so that gives you a certain sense. There are some things that we're all talking about, or everyone's talking about. There are some things that people are very distinctly not talking about. And I want to start off with a question from Slido. I'm not, don't worry, I'm not going to be able to say who asked them all. Mm -hmm. But which sort of like um, looked at um, an issue between, I guess, between um, Tanya and Eric. Um, but various people were asking Eric, where are the people going to go? from one half for nature for the other half. And some people said, aren't you just proposing a huge, great green grab? And I wonder if Tanya could reflect maybe on, 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 her, on her response to what this actually means in livelihood terms. Are you asking me first? I'm asking you first. Okay, yeah. sure. Um, I, I'm not sure where the idea of, of land grab comes in. I, I, I was trying to be explicit um, <coughs> in stating that uh, of the the... 51% um, of the earth is already human dominated and that's not taking anything away from that. that that's, that's the reality that we confront right now, we face right now. That other 49% of that, about 37% is um, under the jurisdiction formally or informally of indigenous communities. No one is saying take that land away, just the opposite is how do we empower 
indigenous communities to be able to make those decisions they want to make that's, uh, as sovereign nations. Many of them who are aware of the Global Deal for Nature have um, signed on to this as, as in consistent with their traditions. So I, I'm not sure where land grabs come in. It's like, where will people go? I, I would turn that question around or, or maybe give it an, another, uh, another tweak is to say, if we uh, allow um, emissions to continue to rise to, um, to drastic levels and get above the threshold of 1.5 degrees C, then some of the predicted outcomes um, will actually lead to where will the people go? They will be moving because we'll have perhaps estimated as many as 100 million people by 2050 as environmental refugees, as drought, crop failures make them move somewhere else where there's perhaps more hope. Um, Getting, going from 1.5 degrees um, C to 2 degrees C means basically the end of coral reef systems. And as I said earlier, you have up to 2.2 billion people relying on those systems for daily protein. So where will those people go? They will move <clears throat> inland to find um, other protein sources, or they'll move to cities where there's some perception that there's more opportunities there than in remote areas. So um, I would say rather than land grabbing, it's, it's, it's sustaining the land. Um, and that uh, it's trying to keep people um, where they are, unless they choose to move, but to keep where they are and, and have more fulfilling livelihoods. Tanya, how does that sound to you? I have a bit of a question around the idea of indigenous people, and it's an issue on which I've worked quite a bit in a sort of Asian context, and I think it's a little different from the Amazon. Um, you know, most of the the question of who is indigenous in Asia and in Africa is far from obvious. And what you're often talking about is the mass of the rural population, you know, differentiated by different ethnic and cultural differences, no doubt. But most of these people, at least since colonial times, 200 years at least, have been involved in commodity production, they're producing for world markets, they're producing their own food, food for cities. So, you know, they're not really, you know, Amazonians in nature. You know, there's a lot of rural people who don't fit that model. And so I'm wondering, you know, that would be one of my questions, like where are they in your mod All of those ordinary peasant, small-scale farmers of whom there are, you know, a good billion or two would be my question. And then the second is, you know, the where you show your sort of, you know, the bans for conservation actually coincide with where I showed yesterday the World Bank map of, you know, areas with the greatest potential dollar value per hectare if only they were put under intensive agriculture. So, you know, there's, there's, another, land, there's another lens, a capitalist lens, one could say, you know, a, a lens looking for maximum value per hectare on that same territory. Great, great points. Um, so I'm American, but I feel like I'm half Nepali. I spent eight years living in mm -hmm. Nepal. I speak Nepali fluently. I speak an indigenous language, Taru, fluently. Um, when I lived there, and uh, I was once talking to a, a, an elderly Taru gentleman mm -hmm. who said to me, um, you know, what do you think about this national park next to you and restoring buffer zones? And he said, oh, this is great. You know. I don't want to you know, bring the jungle back. I don't want to live next to a degraded environment, in, in so many words. Mm -hmm. And over the course of 30-something years, I've worked in many countries around the world, rich in biodiversity and relatively poor countries. I've never heard a single person say to me, I want to live next to a degraded environment. That's just not in our nature, you know, and that people want to live next to a place that's, you know, clean air, pure water, rich soils, um, enough food to grow. Um, in the maps that you're talking about, so the one that shows the areas that one of bright red colors, um, in all of those ecoregions, um, the 192, that's where most of the world's populations are centered, where most of agriculture occurs. There's nobody that's saying that should be displaced. In fact, that's where agriculture should intensify. And th there, there isn't that much conflict really between the places of very high population density or agricultural extraction and biodiversity. A lot of biodiversity that exists, the richest parts are on very poor soils um, that really can't be farmed very well. So there's, particularly in the tropics, in the temperate zone, yes, of course. But as I said in our session yesterday, um, no one is advocating, that there's three tall grass prairie ecoregions in the United States that are part of the breadbasket of the world where a lot of so soybeans and corn are grown and wheat. Um, 
and nobody is saying that that, that should go back to nature. You know, is, is we're, we're trying to accommodate both. It's a balancing act, but um, I think there is um, a way of solving those issues. Um, but clearly, um, greater production on already used lands is a key part of it. Patricia, how do you, how, how do you feel about that? In the, yep. I'm pretty sure I don't have a particularly great spatial memory, but I kind of suspect that some of those places that were on the World, Bank, World Development Report map and that were on the uh, ecoregions map were also in your presentation. Yes, um, thank you for asking. And actually, um, I was thinking right now on um, the, the time I spent in sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia working with smallholders. And I don't recall one single time that a family of smallholder farmers will tell me that they want their kids to be farmers like them. And, and perhaps more importantly, if you ask the, 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 new, the young generations of farmers, they don't want to stay there. <laughs> they want to move to cities. So, um, I mean, I understand that there is, the, there is people living in the, in the farmland that we need to do the, uh, our best to give them the same opportunities as people living in urban areas, but at the same time, there is a mega trend that is happening all over the world, not only in low-income countries, but also in the US, where people from rural areas just move to the cities. And to my, to my view, that's not necessarily bad, yeah, because on the, other, on the other hand, that allows to have larger a scale, which is needed for commercial farmers, um, also allows better protection of biodiversity and natural resources, because we know that encroachment many times, encroachment of natural ecosystems many times is related with rural population. So um, I feel empathy about the idea of um, having uh, people living in the farmland and trying to give them the best opportunities we can. But at the same time, I can see the war evolving in a way in which most of the people, at least three out of four people, will live in, in cities uh, in 30 years on the road and, and the farms will be um, less and less populated and probably more dependent on mechanization, for example, for farming. And now, an interesting thing that's come up out, or actually out of Slido, and I did not in any way mean to disparage Slido, I was maybe, maybe being slightly ironic, I am looking at it. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, one interesting question was actually about Nepal and a question, but a question for Tanya, which says that in Nepal, um, there's a lot of migration and a lot of forest regeneration, and why isn't that the case in Kalimantan? Well, it's interesting because these rural livelihoods you're talking about in Nepal are heavily subsidized or supported by the massive export of migrant labor population, right? So Nepali rural is a, you know, it appears like a, a conservation friendly rural because people are not actually gaining their livelihoods from the land in Nepal. Significantly, it's a remittance economy. Uh, it's actually, I, if I could correct that, since I've lived there since, been there since 1975, the, the one in ten uh, ne Nepali men uh, are outside the country earning a living in the Middle East or somewhere else. But that's a phenomenon that only started back in the 90s, and the reforestation effort started um, in the 80s. There, there's 40 percent more for the, the 40 percent of the country is now forested again. Mm -hmm. There's far more forest in Nepal than um, there is, um, you know, in in India, for example. It's a question I had with Ruth DeFries. Is like. You go across the border, it's the same ecosystem. Why does this work really well, community forestry, mm -hmm. across Nepal, and why does it not work as well in, say, Uttar Pradesh or Bihar? I think mm -hmm. that's a really interesting. Mm -hmm. Kalimantan is a whole other issue, of course. Yeah, so there's I mean, no oil palm in Nepal. If there right. was oil palm in Nepal, <laughs> we'd probably be in total agreement. Right. So I think what we're dealing with in a country like Indonesia is a massive labor reserve called Java, you know, um, which means that there's an endless supply of extremely cheap labor within the country. Uh, so opportunities, you know, when, you, when you talk about out-migration from the rural area, from a place like Kalimantan, what, you're gonna go to Jakarta and, and compete with 100 million Japanese, you know, who are already there and entrenched. So in a way, it comes to your, you know, to your city question. But this idea of the sort of, you know, the endless assumed absorptive capacity either of cities, which I think is your model. I mean, Latin America is highly urbanized, right? It is an urban. I think the you know, percentage of rural population there is, is extremely low. But the same thing is not happening in areas, in parts of Asia, which are labor stuffed both in the country and in the city already. And I, so that would be, you know, why that model doesn't work. There's only three million Indonesians in the global diaspora. Hmm. 
you know, in a, in a it, wow. so some people make their way out, but very few. Mm. Most of the labor migration is rural to rural, people moving towards the plantation zone from others, or it's urban to rural, urban lumpen people and unemployed people moving to the plantations. But basically, there's, there's, there's labor stuff everywhere. And I think if you look at India, it's the same, right? Um, so these are two massive agrarian economies which do not have that capacity to just like, absorb everybody into the city in the way that you're imagining. Trump, how do these labor concerns fit into your visit? Mm -hmm. you, you, you mentioned the idea of um, implosive or pseudo-urbanization. How do, how do these ideas fit together for you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, for me, uh, from my experience, what I see is that um, the way that rural areas have been developed for a long time is to keep the labor force within the rural areas in Africa um, through agriculture. Lots of improvements that have been tried in agriculture, but that is not actually helping that much. So what's happening is that the excessive labor is moving to the cities, which neither also do have opportunities and absorption into the urban labor force. So that, that is still a big challenge in, in, in terms of labor force absorption in both economies, rural or urban. And, and the way I see it is that it's, we, we have to go beyond looking at cities that are bounded and fixed and rural areas that may be bounded or fluid, fluidly bounded and fixed around resource uh, extraction, but rather the interactions between rural and urban through creation of opportunities. Because what the labor force are looking, the people are looking for is opportunities, whether in cities or migrating to rural areas. It's, opportunities. Now, this is where the innovation in terms of opportunities creation actually lies, and more specific uh, fine-grained activities in respect to, um, for example, biomass renewable businesses using the business model, um, resource flows, and uh, those are kind of things I can think of very quickly mm -hmm. that could possibly gradually actually um, um, absorb some part of the labor force, both in rural and urban. But the bigger part of the labor force would continue to look up to industrial zones and urban areas as the source of opportunities, and uh, therefore innovation within those cities, within cities, is very critical. So do you see in that uh, the same thing that Tanya was talking about, of um, basically national and purely modernist accounts of modernization mm -hmm. on, uh, on, on one hand, and a post-national global trade regime on the other one, basically not, the city is where, the, is one of the places, it's like the bearing where that tension has to be either absorbed or whatever. Yeah, I, the tensions will continue. We have uh, in Africa um, foreign direct investments and mm. um, um, attraction of investments um, by the nation states. And, and the thinking is that that will provide the economic opportunities to absorb the labor. So a lot of um, accounting is done in respect to justification is we're going to create 4,000 jobs with these industries or with this palm plantation. We also have them in East Africa, they are emerging. And that is the kind of modernist, uh, modernist thinking at the national level. But I'm not sure that that is actually going to help because the demographic um, changes are so fast and geometric in, the sen in that sense that the absorption rate is going to be continuous. So it's going to be a challenge and there's need for more innovation and thinking about whether going modernist or a different approach. I want to ask you, Heinz, um, uh, and we'll go back to slide, slide soon, but when you were listening to the presentations by um, Patricio and by Eric, how do they fit with your understanding of the carbon absorption capacity and the, 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 the land use questions? And then after you've said that, I also mm -hmm. want to ask people how this is going to sound ruder than I mean it, but how useful is the top-down approach in terms of NPP to the work that you do? But first of all, I wanted to ask yeah. you about your, your approach to that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, how can I start? Um, <laughs> well, Bear, I strongly agree is that we need urgent action. So this is very much what, what uh, Eric was telling us. Uh, we cannot just continue and wait, because this will aggravate the pressures to the climate system and then back to the land. Mm -hmm. So this is, uh, I think, one thing. And we are facing, uh, let's say, challenges of food security. And increasing and closing the yield gaps is good. And I think when these two things come together, we need a good balance between the land sparing and land sharing. It cannot mm -hmm. be either or. 
uh, most probably. At least we have to find out what the implications are. For instance, if we look at, uh, at the half-Earth approach and we protect, we have to understand what is protection, what is uh, happening on the other land. How do we get this intensification going on in order to provide the food security? How do we close the yield gaps? If we do it in the common way, in the way we have developed over the last, let's say, 150 years uh, since industrialization, we will do it with carbon costs, with strong carbon costs. So the, <coughs> the decarbonization and the sustainable land system approaches need to be developed further here. I think in these terms <coughs> it fits well, but the challenge is not solved by that. Mm -hmm. uh, the challenge starts in the details, I would say. Uh, for instance, where do you protect land? How much land can be... When, what is really protection? Is it really keeping people completely out? Which is not something you said before, because the people should stay on the land. But then it is, how do they act? How do they use biomass? If biomass is used, we see that there is a, a legacy effect, that we are getting carbon costs out of that. So we have to be very careful. Mm -hmm. We have the problem of this type of protection, that we keep the principle of permanence. Who is guaranteeing that the, the stocks we, we, we build up will stay there and not in 2030 for whatever change it will release and will, it will be a massive boom then? And we always have the problem which closely relates to what was just discussed of leakage. So uh, if we kind of do something in this place, uh, what is happening in other places? These teleconnections will relate very much to urban, mm. urban rural interlinkages. I think they are important. <laughs> It's not a contradiction in thing, but the top-down view um, gives kind of the boundaries and tells mm -hmm. us um, about the urgencies and about the possibilities and non uh, impossibilities of certain pathways. Um, I think the most important, and that this is not really coming out yet, and it has to do with the labor force, it is uh, the land system and how we use land and all the means of production we use and all the ecosystem services we gain from that is closely linked to the energy system. And the energy system now is an industrialized energy system. Mm -hmm. And we cannot, by kind of incremental changes, think and hope that uh, energy demand will be reduced because we protect land. Uh, we have to reconcile these, these things, and we have to think them in a more comprehensive way, I think. And that means, uh, most probably, that we are uh, kind of... Uh, ahead of us is a big, a big transformation, actually, which is as fundamental as maybe the change from the agrarian mode of subsistence to the industrial uh, mode of subsistence was. But we still don't see what it is. And maybe half-Earth is one of the solutions here. <coughs> it is more starting with the target. We have to understand how to come up, how, how to transform society right. in such a direction. But this is already far beyond what, uh, well, no, what but the it climate does, story it, tells well, us. But yes, but that's the point, mm -hmm. isn't it? That everything is far beyond what the climate story yeah. tells us, or that the climate story is a way into telling every other story. Um, and so there is a, there's a line of, um, of questioning, uh, um, uh, what I might term in one of the more intemperate um, uh, contributions, the neoliberal cop-out line of questioning um, that we're picking up on the app at the moment. Of Aren't you all tending to, maybe with some honorable exceptions, tending to avoid questions of consumption in the developed world, consumption among the well-off in the developing world, um, food equity, food system waste, and concentrating, as it were, on the, um, on, on the close to biology ends of these issues and not the close to human motivation ends. Patricia, you look like you wanted well, to take that, so yeah. thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I want to I wanna jump into that question because I, I talked a little bit about that in my presentation, but perhaps it was not clear or it get diluted among the other 100 slides. Um, but um, the important thing here, and I think that someone mentioned that, is, is to understand what's the timeline for impact. Uh, changes in diets, um, reduction in, in wastage, um, in waste, um, becoming vegetarians, um, those are all things that could potentially have great impact in, re in reducing our demand uh, for food, uh, for biofuels, for fiber. Uh, but it's, it's, very, it's very difficult to see how those things may happen or may have a tremendous impact in, in only 30 years, which is the timeline uh, that uh, we have on mind to increase our food production by 50% 
on existing cropland area. And so, so timeline is, is one important thing to consider. How, how the timeline for all these suggestions fit with our uh, need to meet a 50% increase in global food demand in, in only 30 years. Now, the other aspect is that um, many of the solutions that we propose to implement in developed countries or in high-income countries are, are irrelevant or a little bit irrelevant uh, at a global picture because, as I showed in my presentation yesterday, uh, most of the increase in, in food demand will be driven by what happens in, in low-income countries. And these are countries in which the diet, the, the, the diet needs to become, needs to increase, and, needs to, and these people need to eat more meat and more livestock products. <laughs> it will be very unfair for us, Americans or Europeans, to ask as people in Sub-Saharan Africa or in Southeast Asia not to increase their consumption of livestock products. So these are, so we are saying that most of the, most of the new mouths that will be invited to the global dinner during the next 30 years will be from low-income countries. And, this pe and these are people who are now eating very little meat and livestock products, and they need to improve their diet. So, so again, there are many things that we can do on the consumption side, on the demand side, to reduce our food demand. But, but again, those, those suggestions need to be realistic and consider both the timeline and also where that extra demand will be coming from. Trump, how does the urban peri-urban agriculture system, is that a response to this meat need? Um, it could be a response, and we can think about it um, having a cumulative impact. Mm -hmm. If you look at multiple cities, um, um, taking the food systems approach and providing some of the protein through, for example, poultry or pigger or other things within the city region. But there's a lot of debate about the risks also associated with the urban and peri-urban agriculture, and especially in the midst of um, industrial activity, mm -hmm. and the possibilities for um, trace metals and other pollutants right. into the food systems. But I think that uh, if we take the approach of food systems within city regions, there's a possibility to reduce the um, impact on the hinterlands and the digital teleconnections where mm -hmm. food is coming from um, by producing maybe 10, 15, perhaps even 30%, depending on the ecology of the cities. We did uh, an assessment of that, uh, of a couple of cities in Africa, West Central and Eastern Africa. And there is a potential, but the thing is that it's not been tested, it's not mm -hmm. been validated as to how much can be, and there are a lot of biases about um, urban and peri-urban agriculture. But in terms of protein, yes, there is a proportion that could potentially be produced within uh, the urban city region food systems. Yeah. <coughs> I want to come back, though, to this, this question of being at the biological, geophysical end and being at, being at the social end. I'm, I'm struck, Eric, you present and when we were talking yesterday, you presented um, your proposals as almost sort of like a logical conclusion of the place where humanity finds itself. But I was wondering, why do you call it a global deal for nature, not a global deal for people? Uh, because I see that people are part of nature. It's in, in, in that we, we can't survive without nature. We evolved from it. Um, we're part of it. Uh, I, I think... A number of the comments yesterday in our in our session said, "Well, this dichotomy between nature and people, um, I, I don't see one. You know, I, I um, whether it's indigenous communities who are very close to nature and understand it better than anybody, or even urban dwellers at the other end of the spectrum who maybe their relationship is inspirational, as you had in your slide, or or just uh, relaxation. There there are these deep." genetically based connections to nature. So that's why I, I don't see the difference. But then where do you see the conflict? Um, uh, I think the conflict comes from a number of sources. Um, one that didn't get mentioned in our um, groups yesterday um, when someone said, well, what's the ultimate cause of a lot of this? No one mentioned the words uh, greed and corruption um, because that also figures into this in a big way, is that... Um, there's, there's probably an oversupply of, oil, of, of palm oil in the world, and yet we still keep seeing more and more oil palm plantations being developed, largely because some groups want to clear the forest, profit from that, and then plant oil palm because it's so profitable. 
Um, that's not really in line with, I think, sustainable management of resources. Um, so I think that um, better stewardship of the lands that we have, I think, um, can provide the basis you know, for uh, multiple scenarios for the future and, and, and a safe operating space. I mean, I think that, as I see it, the challenge is that people of, of our generations are really making all the decisions now that have such strong implications for the generations to come, like, like Greta Thunberg's generation. And they're going to have a lot less influence of changing things because of decisions we've made now. And so, I mean, it's kind of like the, the point that you and I were discussing um, yesterday too, Oliver, um, about so the, the graph that I showed where um, basically emissions need to peak at 392 um, gigatons of, of carbon, there's no error bars around that. Okay, and, and there should be, um, but this graph was just generated last month, and so mm -hmm. we'll, we'll add those in. But, but let's say that for some reason we're off in our calculations and it's actually 2 or 2.5 degrees that we could actually still function. Um, well, if that's the case and we're wrong on that part of the error bar, then what we've done is to give Greta Thunberg and, and, her, and the millennials many more options for the future of how they want to allocate land. But the other side of the error bar if we're off and it's really more like 1.4 degrees or one degree, um, then we're really in for a very, very difficult time in the future. And so I think that you know, it's, it's upon all of us to figure out what is that safe operating space. And the answer, depending on where, that's globally, but locally where you live, whether it's in Kampala or whether it's in Kalimantan, there are different decisions to be made. And in some places it's going to be, we need to intensively use this land to, to create as much food as we can or to do intensive livestock management to provide the protein. But in other parts, clearly the best use uh, for this land is to sequester as much carbon as we can. And so th that to me is the, the really big challenge is, is how do we have that inspirational leadership um, to see uh, how, how to move forward? I suspect, well, I will ask that Tanya doesn't see this entirely in terms of inspirational leadership, mm -hmm. but also in terms of what you describe as greed as being an institutionalized global system of capitalist exploitation. And, which is kind of how I say it too. Um, <laughs> and given that, one of the questions that came in, I couldn't actually find it just now, but, but was basically that you said something in your talk, Tanya, about their base, they're not being a solution to the labor issues, you are, livelihood issues you identified within the capitalist system. Is that a fair, fair summary? And if so, what do, you take from, what do you take from that about either the, na the nature of the change required or the likelihood of change? Yeah, I do think that. I mean, I, when I talk about surplus population, I'm not talking in Malthusian <laughs> terms about you know, too many people, but definitely, uh, in what Marx called the relative surplus population, right? More people than capital needs mm -hmm. in order to get the returns that capital expects in the global economy. And so I, no, I don't see a resolution to that problem within the field of capitalism. And none of these uh, solutions, industrial investment, none of them are designed to be labor absorbing. They're designed to be uh, profit producing, right? That's in the nature of capitalism. So I think to, to, to move away from that, you would have to pre present or think through an entirely different equation, for, which for me would put the question of distribution at the core, right? If one asked a different question, like how do six or seven billion people that there are get a fair share of the means of leading a decent life, like you know, for me, that would be like the core value. You know, the, the organizers asked us like, what do we want? I would say, that's what I want. I mm. want a world in which all the people on the, world, on the earth have a decent chance at a, a good livelihood. If that was your central problem you were trying to address, you could not address it through capitalist means, right? You would have to think in distributive terms about you know, how do people access those resources? If you're only assuming that the rising tide of capital lifts all boats, you know, we've seen 30 years of neoliberal um, policies which have not produced that outcome, but in fact, 
a lot of the catastrophe that we see today. So I think that's a very different question. It's a different, you know, you would have to think differently. I think it would be interesting to think of, of, uh, of your model, um, you know, or even the Kampala model. If you put that question, the distributive question, how do all the people that there are now and to come um, get a decent livelihood, uh, how would all of these big graphs and equations look? What would need to happen for that to be the core value? I'm interested to try on that. And although I think we all agree that the classic modernization narrative is bust for various different reasons about middle income traps and that sort of thing, is not even a pseudo urbanization still a place where people can do more, interact more, increase their livelihoods in ways that they simply can't um, in the rural environment? Um, I don't know about uh, zero urbanization. Mm -hmm. I think that we'll, um, we're going to see more of agglomeration. So I said well, pseudo, uh, not zero. What? Go, go on, sorry. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I didn't get that one. But um, what I think of is that there is a possibility, although we can hardly get our hands onto um, the real, the, the real practicalities of how livelihoods and well-being can be improved in cities at a, mu at a much more fine-grained scale. There, there have been a few piloted or tested initiatives to improve well-being mm -hmm. and livelihoods in cities, looking at, um, for example, recycling, um, which some people now think of as circular economy, you're basically getting materials and energy through the system so you have less, less leakage um, mm -hmm. from cities. And, and, and the big question is how do you make that decent for the labor force? That has always been because the modernist uh, capitalist world tends to provide um, economic opportunities that are considered to be decent if you're working in an industry or in the service industry or something. But what about if you're working within the waste sector and it's about recycling? What about if it is biomass energy um, and you know, taking advantage of the demand within the cities which could play into the transformation of behavior and lifestyle in terms of energy demand within cities? I think, I think it's still a big question. There's still room for ex uh, experimentation of how all this could contribute to um, better livelihoods and uh, decent workplaces. I think that slightly answers the quest question I, I was going to do next, but um, I wanted to come to Patricio and, and to Eric. You heard very eloquently from Tanya the idea that, this is, that the issue that she brings to the table, the, what you want to see, um, doesn't get solved in an existing capitalist paradigm. Do either of the issues that you were talking about in terms of either global food supply or global, conversation, or global conservation, are those actually things to which you can imagine the current world order successfully responding? Um, okay, so um, thank you for the question, because actually I, want, I wanted to desperately talk about that. Um, <laughs> um, I mean, it's, it's okay that we keep recognizing the complex war in which we live and all the interrelationships that there are among all the different components. It's very good to think ahead on, on a model of society uh, in which everybody receives a, a, a more fair uh, share. But, but now we have 30 years to uh, increase our food uh, production by 50%, and we need to do that on existing crop land area. Otherwise, um, we will keep exacerbating uh, climate change through through land conversion. And we know that every single year we are expanding our cropland area by 13 million hectares. So we are not doing good, okay? And we need to change things now, or we need to do something differently. So that means to, to set priorities, okay? Understanding all the complexity, uh, you get to a point in which you have to start simplifying things at the far end of complexity, uh, because you have to prioritize where to invest. And in a way, Setting priorities is like betting for horses at the, at the racetrack, right? And you want to bet for those horses that have the, the best odds for winning, right? And, and we can learn something about the past and where we are now. And it's very, clearly that, it's very clear to me that one of the major priorities uh, over the next 30 years should be in promoting intensification through gig up closure on land that is currently under a cropland. 
And at the same time, making all the investments that are needed to have all the regulation and all the institutions that are needed to be on place to ensure that those intensification gains will eventually translate into land savings. Uh, but because uh, otherwise, I feel like if we keep recognizing complexity and we don't go be too much beyond that, uh, that will create some immobilization and we won't be able to move forward. And one of the questions that's come up repeatedly for you on the website have been questions about distribution and about um, uh, overconsumption of meat in places where it is overconsumed. Do you see, and waste, do you see those as complexity issues that in the end become second order and that the production issue is the key one? Sorry, can you... Do you see those issues of waste and oh. preference and equity in distribution as effectively what you were talking about as the complexifying issues and the first order issue remains intensification for you? Yeah, of course, we should invest on all possible solutions. But I think that's that we not how you win money at the racehorses, though. Yeah. <laughs> you don't bet on all of them. But, <laughs> but, but to make priorities, people should think like if they were investing from their own pocket. And when you have to invest from your own pocket, you, 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 you usually think on two things. The timeline to get a return to that investment and what's the, 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 the chance of success. So you need to put all those solutions in the food, um, on the global food problem into that matrix that has time for impact and uh, time for return to investment. And then you make investments based on that. Okay, Eric, I wanted to bring, I'll come, come to you. I wanted to bring that question that I asked earlier back straight to you, Eric, about the question of can you see that which you want to see created within the world system that we live in, the political, economic, social world system that we live in? Okay. Are you asking for a fundamental disruption or are you suggesting something that you think is profoundly doable in the world as it is? I guess if I answer that question truthfully, I might not be allowed back in the United States. <laughs> but uh, We um, must all take risks. <laughs> <laughs> Switzerland has very generous asylum. <laughs> um, well, well. Let, let, me, let me start by answering that question, and, and not, not in a facetious way, but, um, but in, in a strategic way. And then, but I'm, I'm going to gravitate towards where, where, where Tanya is. Um, to achieve the global deal for nature, we think we need about $100 billion a year. And um, the capitalist system has created a number of people who have bet on the right horses and won a lot of money. <laughs> and they put that aside somewhere, you know. And I think that um, there are, if, if those, let's just stick with the companies, you know, if, if they want to see their companies um, continue over the next 10, 20, 30, 50 years and reap the profits they are, then there's investments they have to make in nature, whether it's the insurance industry, whether it's forestry or fisheries or agriculture, there's tremendous payoffs in investing in nature. And so I, I'd like to see that transformation happen. Um, and I think that um, we need, that, that the capital system can generate those if we have the right leadership. However, I also think that like the Green New Deal in the United States, really is underpinned more towards a socialist transformation. And I think that I'm, I'm very, I find a lot of affinity with that as well. I'm just not sure that, um, that in, the sh in the short term, meaning the next 10 years, that we're gonna find some of the solutions that we want. I, I think that some of these are gonna require a longer term approach. But, but definitely, your point, Tanya, about you know, making one of the central themes um, about improving the livelihoods or getting to, to a level where everybody has, you know, an, an equitable or a livelihood. A decent. Sorry? Mm -hmm. Yes, a decent livelihood. Whatever adjective you want to, want to use there. I like decent. Schwab used the word. I think decent is a very good word. Yeah. It has. I mean, for, <laughs> as opposed to an indecent one, I guess, um, is that uh, in, in America we have a lot of people that, again, I won't get allowed back in answer, indecent livelihood. We practice that. Uh, it's kind of like an anti-Buddhist uh, term, I guess, indecent <laughs> livelihood. But Getting in deep water here. Like okay, <laughs> Heinz, you want anyway, to, you want to comment on this. But I do think this. that we need to, yeah, sorry. So, I can be very short because it's a bit on, on the line, but when what Patricia said, I would agree that, yes, we need intensification in places where the harm is already done and we do not do a lot of further harm. But if we do this unaccompanied, uh, kind of without taking care about the collateral things happening in the, let's say, economic capitalist system. We cannot expect 
the sharing taking place, the land, the land sparing. We, will not, we do not observe land sparing where we have intensification, no. We see commodification, we see more production because we can produce more and ever more. And if we kind of bet on this one horse, uh, uh, we cannot guarantee that the collateral damages are too massive, actually, because there is no internal feedback in the system we have, which is providing the checks and balances, I think. That are just, uh, it's, it's along the line. Okay, we're, we're running So it is one side of the, of the metal, yes, but we need other things as well. Mm -hmm. And they have to do with the labor system and they have to do with uh, other ways of doing what we do. We're running out of time and I just want to come back with a very quick fire round to all of you, um, which you will hate me for, but that's okay because I'm on a train later. So. <laughs> um, which is, from each of you, in as little as one word, as much as one sentence, cause for optimism, cause for pessimism. Um, I'll start with you, Heinz, and we'll go along the table. Uh, along the so, I have to start? Yeah, you have to start, because <laughs> I just arbitrarily chose that. Uh, <laughs> one optimism, one pessimism. Um, the optimistic view would be uh, there is a large potential of innovation in society, and we can change and we can adapt, and this is, this is what makes us human. Uh, the pessimism is uh, the current system, the fossil fuel system, is so resilient. It's, we tried a lot of things of changing it, and we have not succeeded in changing it. Not even a bit would be my personal thing. And I'm not sure that we can change it within the time remaining, within the time frames we discussed. That's the pessimism. Perfect. Everyone else should do, do it like he did it. Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, um, the optimism is about how and when we can get an understanding of the impact of the climate system as a feedback on the profitable economic sectors. Because if we get that, then the capitalist world will realize the importance of the transformation. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why I picked my um, optimism. Um, the pessimism is that um, changing um, systems, capitalist and governance systems, will be like moving a mountain. Actually, we move mountains these days. That's part of the okay. problem. But <laughs> <laughs> anyway. I don't know. Well, as a conservation biologist, you have to be an optimist to stay in the profession for more than a few <laughs> years. Uh, so um, I would say my optimism is um, placed on innovation um, and ingenuity um, of the human species to figure some really creative ways out of some of the really difficult problems we've gotten ourselves into. And my pessimism, I, I guess I would, I think uh, Heinz stated that very eloquently, um, that mountain, you know, we haven't budged that much of fossil fuels. And, and if we, it's, it, it is the greatest existential threat that we face. If we don't solve that one, um, everything else as important as it is becomes a little bit secondary. Good. So, you know, I'm an agronomist, so I need to talk about the Green Revolution. So um, if the challenge is to increase food on existing cropland area, we have already done that in the past once, no? uh, through the Green Revolution, which saved land and which took people out of poverty. So there was already, we already have something that helped people to, um, to be able to, uh, to lift people out of poverty and at the same time produce more food. Now, um, I have some sources of pessimism, which is that we haven't learned too much from the mistake of that Green Revolution. And if we, and, and if we haven't learned, that means that we're probably going to repeat them again. So good news is that we have already have a Green Revolution, and, and we eventually know that it's possible to keep increasing our yields and try to do so in an environmental friendly way. But at the same time, I can see that people don't recognize that there were problems associated with intensification that needs to be much better addressed. I think I would put the optimism in what I call the kind of capacity for critique. You know, this idea that we can all feel uncomfortable with the world as it is and have a sense that this cannot be the best we can do. You know, we should be able to do better. I see this, you know, everywhere in the room. I see it among my students. Like, if we did not have that, then when it's really over, you know, if, if the idea that there is no alternative reigned, you know, that would be, that would be a worse scenario. My pessimism is that you know, most of the, the discussion, I think you, know, you raised this question, but we didn't come back to it, about like, who is the addressee of 
these sort of schemes for transforming the world. And most resources, populations, decisions are actually national, you know, so the question of, of you know, who, who do we imagine to be the enlightened, you know, uh, who, will make, who will make these changes, like that's, that seems to be a whole huge question, which is really integral to a top-down approach. Right, you, you, it's what I call the will to improve. Like you have a sense of how the world should be reorganized, but how to get there from here is not a technical question. Right. So that's a. Uh, um, uh, I hope that that's provided some raw material for your own optimism. Um, I will leave you to draw your own conclusions about what you should be duly pessimistic about. <laughs> um, but please join me in thanking the Food for Optimism and Pessimism provided by the panelists, both in their plenaries and today in this panel. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>